Hi, and welcome to this ninth lecture. Uh, today we'll be discussing registry-based improvement of cervical screening programs. My name is Miriam Elfstrom, and I work as a postdoc at the Department of Laboratory Medicine, the Karolinska Institute, and I also work uh, with the regional uh, screening programs at the Regional Cancer Center of Stockholm, Gotland. So I work directly with the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the cervical cancer screening program for our region. The main message for today is that registry uh, data can help us answer complex questions on risk factors for disease, as well as the effectiveness of implemented strategies, and that improvements are dependent on systematically collected data that reflect program implementation. So the topics that we're gonna cover today are why registers and registry-based research, what data are included and how should quality be monitored, what registry-based analysis have changed the screening program in recent years, and then what ethical aspects should be considered. And then finally, I thought I would give a brief overview of what future areas of development are being considered for strengthening the scope of registered data. In all of this, I think it's important to remember that changes to healthcare must be evidence-based, and this is to maximize the benefit to the individual, and then also to ensure the appropriate use of society's resources. So some basic definitions. When we say register, we mean the data itself. We mean a list or record of events in healthcare or uh, individuals or individuals' background characteristics. And when we talk about registries, we mean the office or the place where registers, these lists are held. And this typically refers to an organization. So an organization that uh, takes care of the data and publishes reports, perhaps, uh, and analyzes the data. So what data are included, and how should data quality be monitored? For registry data, uh, we mean data collection. We mean definitions of the variables. And we look at consistency. Uh, and we look at the scope of the data. And registers in the Nordic countries contain longitudinal data. They uh, are continuous or sequential uh, imports, and they are used then to re reconstruct healthcare trajectories over time. And then we use personal identifiers, and this is to follow individuals over time and to link between registers. Not all information is included in one big register, but rather there are different registers for prescriptions, diagnoses, healthcare visits, and then even registers that contain information on education, uh, income of individuals, and marital status. So personal identifiers allow us to link between these different registers to build a picture of each individual's uh, path through healthcare. And then when we talk about quality control, we talk about data extractions. And here, ideally, we would use copies of lab reports, as this doesn't require manual import and ensures then that there isn't any problems with entering data into uh, the system. And we also speak about data interpretation, making sure that we know all of the codes that come in and can uh, translate them into uh, diagnoses. When we talk about quality assurance, we generally refer to four criteria that can be used to ensure the quality of screening registries. And these are outlined in Parkin and Bray's uh, publication from 2009 in the European Journal of Cancer, if you want to read more on them. These four criteria are comparability, uh, completeness, validity, and timeliness. The comparability refers to the standardization of coding and classification systems, uh, so that we have a standard that can be used for data that come in from different regions, for example. Make sure that we can compare uh, and that we mean the same thing. In terms of completeness, we mean the extent to which the data on samples taken in a population are recorded in a registry database. So do we receive all of the lab exports or do we receive only 90% of them? This helps us to understand how representative our data are and whether uh, we have any missingness or certain populations that could be missing, certain diagnoses, certain timeframes. In terms of validity, we mean the accuracy of the information recorded in the registry. And then finally, for the timeliness, we mean the rapidity with which the registry can collect, process, and report 
sufficiently reliable and complete data. And this can look different across different registries. Some receive uh, updates weekly, some uh, receive updates on an annual basis, and some have uh, less structured updates. I thought I would give uh, an example of these criteria as they relate to the Swedish National Cervical Screening Registry. In this registry, we have population data. So we have information on all women in the screening ages, where they live and what age they are. And then we have information from the screening program. We have all of the invitations that were sent. We have the screening test results. So uh, results from HPV testing or cytology. And then we also have the histopathologies, and these are the follow-up tests for screen test positive women. Uh, and this includes uh, results from colposcopies, for example. And then these can be linked with a personal identifier uh, to ensure that we're matching invitations with the screening test that comes and the histopathology, and we know the age and region uh, as well. For the validity of NKCX, uh, we work with direct exports of lab data. And these come from the different regions in Sweden and the different labs within those regions. We work with population data that comes from the tax agency. And then we work with screening program administrative exports. And these come from the screening programs. Uh, and this includes things like uh, invitations. So if a woman was sent an invitation and what date that invitation was sent. For the timeliness, uh, the data requested are our requests are sent out in February of each year, and this is for the data for the preceding year. And the data processing and compilation usually takes two to three months, which means that in late spring, we can publish a report uh, for the year that just passed that includes all of the main monitoring and evaluation indicators. For the comparability, uh, we look at the standardization of diagnosis codes. And here we see in this picture um, the reported diagnosis codes. And uh, we see whether they follow the nomenclature that's set out by our national organizations and whether they were translatable. And you can see that from 2012 to 2016 that the proportion that were uh, following the nomenclature and could be translated has increased dramatically. And this allows us to better interpret uh, the diagnoses and provide more standardized uh, pictures of what is happening in the country. With regard to completeness, um, we map the pap smears uh, by lab and year, for example, as you can see in this graph. And the data are monitored with each import and compared across years. And here you can see uh, that we have data back to 1970, but data are more or less complete from between 1995 and 2000. You can also see that some of the labs have changed over time. So the three uh, labs here at the bottom for the greater Stockholm area uh, were combined into one lab that reports uh, in 2005. And you can also see that some labs have come in later, uh, Halmstad here, while other labs uh, like Javle uh, have submitted data further back in time. And this helps us when we want to do uh, analyses to know how far back in time our data are complete and for which regions. Now, I thought I would go into some of the uh, registry-based analysis that have changed the screening program in recent years and give you some examples of how the data have been used to answer important questions. And I'll start with looking at some long-term follow-up studies, in particular, screening test methods and comparisons of HPV-based screening and cytology-based screening. And these uh, data that I'll present in the next couple slides come from the Swede Screen Study, which was an early randomized control trial started in the late 1990s that compared these two test methods. Um, and then in this first slide, we actually combined the data from the Swede Screen trial with a couple other RCTs out in Europe um, to be able to look at uh, cervical cancer as an endpoint. So for this first analysis, uh, we wanted to look at uh, comparing screening with cytology and HPV-based screening and which provides greater protection against invasive cervical cancer. So the data and registry, uh, registers used were as follows. 
we had uh, data from the RCT on HPV testing. And then we uh, collected 14 years of screening data from NKCX. So we collected cytologies and histopathologies. And then we looked at the total population register to see that the women uh, included in the study were still alive uh, and still resident in Sweden. And then finally, we looked at the Swedish National Cancer Register uh, to see if there were cases of cervical cancer in the study. And then we combined these data with data from three other RCTs. Uh, and this is published in this paper by uh, Guillermo Ronco uh, and others in Lancet 2014. And the results show that uh, HPV-based screening provides 60 to 70% greater protection against invasive cervical cancer. And here we're looking at women negative at baseline and the relative detection rates of invasive cervical cancer. If you look then specifically at different morphologies, so different histopathological types of cervical cancer, then we see here a particular effect for adenocarcinoma. Uh, and also a tendency for effect for squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma, as uh, you probably have gone through previously, is uh, typically easier to detect with cytology. So the effect um, is lesser there and the effect is stronger for adenocarcinoma. Moving on, uh, another question that we wanted to ask uh, was, does the increased sensitivity of HPV-based screening reflect early diagnosis of high-grade lesions, or does it reflect uh, overdiagnosis? And here we used just data from the Swede screen trial, and we followed women over uh, 13 years, as you can see in this graph. Um, and this is time since they were tested. And these are women that were negative at baseline that we followed then over time to see if they had a CIN2 plus. And what we can see is that the increased sensitivity of HPV uh, screening reflects early diagnosis of high grade lesions rather than over diagnosis. So in the HPV arm, we can see a slight increase of uh, CIN2 plus in the beginning, uh, but then it comes together here after about 10 uh, years, and it comes together with those in the cytology arm. And this reflects then that uh, while it may be higher in the beginning, this is early diagnosis of high grade lesions rather than over diagnosis. This meant uh, that uh, these data, as well as the data on uh, cervical cancer uh, from the previous slide, were used when Sweden updated the national guidelines in 2015 and helped to inform the decision to reflect uh, to switch to HPV based screening. We've also done studies on screening effectiveness. And one of the questions that has come is the effectiveness of screening uh, women at the end of the screening interval, so women 61 to 65. And for this analysis, the data in the registers used were the total population register again to identify our women and to ensure that they were living in Stockholm during the study period. We used data from NKCX, the National Cancer Register, and then we also collected information from the National Education Register in the Longitudinal Integration Database for Health Insurance and Labor Market Studies. And this gave us uh, information on the highest education achieved of the women included. We included information from the National Patient Register, as well as the Swedish Causes of Death Register. And what we found was that women who were unscreened or had abnormal results in their 50s had a high risk of cervical cancer after age 60. But for these women, screening at the ages 61 to 65 was associated with a risk decrease up to age 80. And what this means is that in the new screening guidelines, we've increased the upper age limit uh, to, to 64 from age 60 as it previously was. And this uh, to uh, ensure that we are protecting women further up in the ages and uh, identifying potential lesions or infections um, so that we can reduce the incidence of cervical cancer after the screening ages. And this, these results are published in a, a PLOS Med uh, publication this past fall by Zhang Rong Huang and colleagues. 
We've also looked into the investigation of specific diagnoses. And here we were uh, did a study on atypical glandular cells, or AGC, uh, and the risk of cancer associated with that diagnosis. We used information from NKCX, the National Cancer Registry, the National Patient Register, the Total Population Register, and again, the Causes of Death Register. And what we found was that AGC, if it's found in screening, was associated with a high and persistent risk of cervical cancer, and in particular for adenocarcinoma. We also found that the management of AGC has been suboptimal in preventing cancer, and this is as compared to the management of HISO. So the implications of this study have been that we've updated the triage and follow-up protocols for AGC in the new screening uh, recommendations. And uh, regions are now working with how best to put those into practice. And we hope that by following these updated triage and follow-up protocols, uh, we can reduce the risk of cancer after an AGC diagnosis. Now, with regard to ethical aspects, I thought I would go through uh, some practicalities first and then some broader concepts and key issues and ethics. When using registered data, you have to make an application to an ethical review board, and that's the case for Sweden. There are some different uh, differences between structures and approval procedures uh, if you look at the Nordic countries and also out in Europe. And this application includes information on how you'll store the data, the early experience of the researcher, the risks and benefits of the research project, and then the recruitment of study participants and informed consent. And typically, informed consent uh, is not usually required in large-scale uh, register-based studies in Nordic countries, but it's still important to reason around this and to measure the risks and benefits to the individual with using information. And then you even outline how you'll publish the data, how you'll make the data available, and how you'll protect uh, personal data, how you'll protect the individual information that you receive. And this is critical for the use of registered data and the future use of registered data that we maintain the integrity of this process and the integrity of the analysis that we do and the data that we use. When we talk about broader key issues, I think there's some uh, very important concepts that need to be highlighted. Up-to-date, high-quality care requires ongoing clinical research, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And patients are entitled to research. They're entitled to updated information and protocols and strategies uh, in prevention. And here, a population-based screening registry is a basic infrastructure for population-based research. Um, and if comprehensive population-based collection of data is missing, research is not enabled. We cannot conduct the type of uh, studies that are most informative to our program. So if there is ambiguous data on benefits and harms, as well as no infrastructure for quality assurance and clinical research, uh, screening is not ethical and should not be performed. We need this feedback loop in order to ensure that we are doing the right thing. In screening, we invite healthy individuals in to be screened, and then we identify those with a higher risk for future disease. And we're dealing then with a healthy population. We're not dealing with individuals that have sought care on their own. And therefore, I think this point is particularly important that we balance the benefits and harms and that we assure the quality of our program and that we inform our methods with the latest research. Furthermore, the generalizability from research to real life programs can be a problem when ascertaining uh, benefits and harms. Uh, women are entitled to quality assured, uh, to a quality assurance, and this is to ascertain that screening programs do have benefits and that we are limiting the harms uh, as expected. So two main ways that we can deal with this are by doing audits, and this is the investigation of all cases of cancer in a population to see if they could be prevented, to see if there are ways that we can further strengthen the program to avoid further uh, cases. 
And for more on this concept, you can see the paper listed uh, here in BMJ. Routine audit is an ethical requirement of screening from 2001. And the other main component is to have a screening registry. And this is absolutely essential for monitoring benefits and harms of the real life program and to monitor over time so that we look not just this month, but we look o over years to make sure that we're doing the correct activities and implementing the most effective strategies. So what are the future areas of development for strengthening the scope of registered data? So one area that has been uh, of increasing focus is to capture experiences in healthcare. So registries are beginning to implement systematic collection of individual feedback on healthcare. And these are typically in two areas, so-called PROM and PRIM. So patient reported outcomes, and this is the individual care or the clinical outcomes, the symptoms that the individuals uh, experience, or if there's some sort of unmet need that we're not capturing in our, our current routines. And then with regard to PRIM or patient reported experience measures, we try to capture the integration of care, so the journey of the individual through healthcare. And I think this uh, will help us to gain further insight into complications and side effects of treatments. Uh, it'll give us uh, insight into the information that healthcare providers give and whether it's adequate, uh, if it's understood, and if it meets the needs of the individuals. And it will also help us to uh, understand trust in healthcare processes. And with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, registered data is a powerful tool for improving cervical screening programs by evaluating existing strategies and investigating further expansions of the program. And I hope you've uh, been able to see some examples of how we've worked with this. And I invite you to email me uh, if you have any further questions. Thank you so much.